Bill Buford is here. He is a staff writer for the New Yorker magazine where he was fiction editor for eight years. In 2002, he was given the opportunity to train in the kitchen of Mario Batali's three-star New York restaurant, Babo. His new book, Heat, chronicles his time there as well as his apprenticeship with culinary masters in Italy. I am pleased to have him back at this table to talk about food and what happens in the kitchen. Welcome. Thank you very much. Now, here's where we got to start. So what led you to do this? This is a story of a journey of one man in middle age who has a <clears throat> wonderful career, having been in, uh, first in England and then fiction editor for The New Yorker, a writer. You go on this journey that is the kind of fantasy that movies are made about. It, it ended up a journey. It, yeah. uh, it didn't start as a journey. Uh, it actually just uh, started with the opportunity of having Mario over for dinner. And it was such a preposterous, bizarre, outlandish, over-the-top figure that I, I went to The New Yorker the next week and proposed to David Remnick that we write uh, a profile of Mario. I mean, you might know him from the Food Network, yeah, but you yeah. really got no idea. And David said, uh, I should write the profile. And I thought about it, and I, I thought, well, yeah, if I could write it, I've always wanted to work in the kitchen. I've always wanted the kind of knowledge that chefs have. I've always thought, someday I'll get to know some guy and he'll let me go in there on Saturdays or something like that. And I thought, well, you know, here's my chance. All right, two th quick things. Number one, you make the very good point that chefs work with their hands, writers work with their head. Completely, completely. So it was, com it was a complete different thing for me. It was the, uh, you know, one, one of the big lessons I had was hanging out with Marco Pierre White, who taught Mario in the beginning how big a kitchen could be, what the yeah. possibilities were. Yeah. Marco's dyslexic, and he can't work with words. And it was when I realized that he can't work with words. And I, he tried to read a letter, and he, he, was, he, was, he was in pain trying to read this letter. And I realized he couldn't work with words, and how visual his, uh, his whole modus operandi was. That's when I understood that the whole business of being in the kitchen, it's, you know, I learned how to cook to the extent that I did by reading cookbooks. I had an enthusiasm for food, and I, and I, and I, would, I would do it from, from, from inference. But when you're in the kitchen, there's no reading, there's very little language, and it's all hands and eyes, all hands and eyes, and it's all intense, and it's learning how to, it's learning how to teach your fingers to do things. And I, I just found it, uh, you know, I've been at, at, the, at a desk for, for years. Yeah. I, you know, I, I've been very... Typing away. Typing away or sending writers to far-off places yeah. and fixing their reports when they come back or receiving fiction and getting people's exotic accounts of what they were doing. And here I was, you know, no words, no writing, no screen, no keys. I was just uh, learning how to use my hands and standing on my feet and all this physical activity. And I, I found it exhilarating. Let's go back to the dinner party. So you're doing a dinner party for Jay McInerney. In fact, a writer, a writer, and so for some reason, because Mario and Jay are friends or something, acquaintances, you, know, you decide to invite him, and your wife says to you, "Are you nuts?" Uh, she put it more frankly than that. What did uh, she say? Are you out of your well? Effing, I can't use that mind? kind of language on television, but it's the kind of language Mario uses. And since I figured I had so many words of that kind that Mario was used, I wouldn't. Because why that to would her. any human being she, she was cook for that good a chef? She was apoplectic. She said, "What in the?" are we going to do now? <laughs> and in a way, it didn't matter because, uh, well, first, Mario was just so happy to get an invitation because he's a cook, yeah. and he, people don't have him over to eat. But it didn't matter because he arrived, and he was sort of like Santa Claus. He had this giant sack of stuff, including raw pork a fat. Of and beef, a meat. Uh, uh, well, pork, pork fat, which he right. cured, made, la it right. made into lardo, and he sliced it up and put it over the back of his tongue so that you can taste what the pig was eating in the last three months of its fat, 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 fat life. Yeah. You know, none of us had eaten raw pork fat before and then we drank lots of wine and we drank way too much wine and you know the evening ended at three in the morning uh, and lots with, of wine oh uh, you know I, I don't think any of us had drunk that much wine before <laughs> but 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 one of the things we learned is that for Mario it was just a, sort of a modest evening in fact my wife well, how does he me, survive at drinking that much wine who knows I mean at some, at, Parker, at, some, at some point at some point you know when, when the man when the man finally goes into the to, into the better place and well let's hope that as many many decades from now someone's gonna have to do some kind of autopsy on his liver and just find out whatever it is whatever he's got we gotta get <laughs> yes. but you know, his energy is astonishing at the end of that evening which ended up with him doing a sort of air solo guitar to Neil Young's Southern right. Man I, it was my wife just reminded me. He, he also then washed all the dishes, mopped the floor, and then went to put away our cutlery and looked at it and said, "Dudes, what is this drawer?" And then rearranged the entire cutlery and rearranged the entire kitchen, and then took everybody else out to some place at five o'clock in the morning. I mean, the man's kind of like this this kind of furnace of energy. And you then wanted to focus on him 
in well, his Well, I just know at, that, at the time, I just thought that he was obviously a subject for a profile. Yeah. And that didn't a larger me, than life figure. Obviously. And that yeah. just gave me the excuse then to get into his, his kitchen. And how many restaurants does he have in New York? Oh, you know. Five was, or six. I, I saw him last night, and he was sort of listing the rest. He's got about a half dozen, and then he's got a couple more in Las Vegas, and he's got one opening in Los Angeles uh, next month or in two months from now. He's... But, you know, it's, you know, it's a very clever kind of thing that he's done because really what he does is he, he cultivates talents in his kitchen, as everybody does. And then usually what happens when a talent is in a kitchen for a while, they get bored and they go somewhere else. But what he does is he gives them a spot. He, you know, whatever it's a matter of when he gives them a spot to, to go to another place. So he's kind of creating, it's not really like he's duplicating himself. He's like, he's like creating places for his friends. Did you love food before this? I was interested in making food. I liked food. Uh, I was animated by food. Uh, there was something about the, the mystery of food which engaged me, and I liked making it. And one of the things I learned at Babo, I tried to work at the pasta station, which is the busiest, most chaotic, most difficult station. And Mario warned me off. He said, "You know, you're, you're not young enough for it." And I then thought, "You know, I, my poor mind." Yeah. You know, and unfortunately, he was right. But I, I ended up back at the grill station, and one of the sh one of the chefs said, "You want to work at the grill because at the pasta station, you're just reheating stuff that other people have made, but at the grill." You're making Sorry, food, mm -hmm. and that and that and it was it was that choice of that word making food that made me realize this is this is actually what it's all about, and this is one of the gratifications that people don't understand that cooks enjoy, yeah. home cooks, professional cooks, is the act of making food. And when I was working on the line at Babo, I might make you know 50 plates of food and I put them up on the pass, and the executive chef would take it and give it to the runner, and the runner would run it out to the table for it to be mm -hmm. eaten. But every time I put it up to the pass, if I managed to make the plate exactly so. It was a little buzz of satisfaction. I had made this plate of food. It had something here. It had something there. It had something there. It was a little Would, bit architectural. And... Did you do well from the get-go? No. <laughs> <laughs> and Mario told you so. Uh, you know, there was a lot of I told you so. There was yeah. a lot of I told you Just so. Just get out of the way. Let a pro do it. All the way around. Well, you know, when I went in, I didn't realize this, but, you know, kitchens have a thing they call um, a provision for externs. And externs mm -hmm. are people who go to culinary school and they have this three-month stick. And they actually know what they're doing. I mean, right. they've been studying for three years. They're, 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 they're on the way to be professionals. And it was that slot that I filled. So they expected, you know, the prep chef, Elisa Sarno, expected me to be the kind of person who would be in that slot, someone who knew what he was doing. And the first day, I mean, she gave me, like, three boxes of ducks to bone and said, you know how to bone ducks, and then sallied off. And I thought, do I know how to do bone I ducks? Do I know? <laughs> have I ever done this? And then in the end, you know, I had this catastrophic cutting board full of all these bits of ducks and then yeah. sure enough I sliced up a nice little this is not well first of all I was gonna say this is not a harmless profession is it no no I mean, no no can, I did it, we did we there was a lot of there's a lot you of burn yourself you cut oh, yourself covered with burns I'm just cut just like a zebra just covered <laughs> with, and actually it's one of the things you know when cooks go out at the end of the night and they're all buzzy and full of adrenaline yeah. they all roll up their sleeves and they're just like oh. show the scars it's unbelievable. You know, and they're like, ah, oh, miter worse than the miter worse. And some of them, the scars look like they sort of like just lay down on top of So like, tell me what in this experience, because I want to go through the whole thing, including going to, to London and then to Italy. All right. So what did, what did you learn about what makes a great chef? What makes a Mario Batal? Oh, well, Mario is actually a really unusual person. Uh, he's he, unusual because he's... He's a cut above, but cut different. In, in, in all those things. I mean, one, he's literate. And he's smart, and he's verbal, and most cooks are not verbal. Most cooks really are dyslexic yeah. and have trouble with language. And they found it's like the you know the kid from the Bronx who discovers that he can discipline his aggression and be a boxer. I and mean, a lot of them are like, a kitchen is a really weird place to work, and it's the only place they can work. Mario could be like a hundred different things. He's he's full of energy and stamina and imagination, and he's, he's you know he's he's a great great cook. But one of the things, you know, he told me in the beginning is that when I go there, I'm going to learn the difference between a professional kitchen and cooking at home. And, ah. and it's not, you know, it's not a big difference, but you learn, you learn a bunch of things. And one of which is that it's very disciplined. Um, it's, uh, it's doing the same thing over and over again to perfection. It's working under unbelievable you know, demands of, of scheduling and pressures. And you also learn things that, which I'd, I'd never known before, this, this whole thing called kitchen awareness what you learn in the kitchen. And it's, you don't learn it. And at home, you read a recipe, and you go, okay, i got to do that 375 degrees, and then I take it out, and I turn it once, and I take it out again, and turn it. Kitchen awareness is, uh, you're just so aware of what's going on in the kitchen that you're listening and smelling the whole time. And you can tell, you know, one of the things they do is they do Brussels sprouts. They, they, they boil them, and then they put them in ice, and they cut them in half, and they put them on a frying pan. And then they get the frying pan really, really, really hot, and they pour, pour some oil, and then they just let it sit until it browns yeah. and caramelizes. And 
normally I'd like peeking to see if it's cooked and peeking to see if it's right. But when you when you get kitchen awareness, you just listen. And there's a the the Brussels sprout starts to the texture starts to change when it starts to caramelize. And you can once you're in the kitchen long enough, you can hear the the change in the texture, and you know it's done. And you can do that with smell. You know when meat is cooked. You know when your pasta is cooked. It's all on using smell and senses in a in a whole way that I never used before. Now, what role does he play today in the kitchen? Well, he's kind of the executive genius. Uh, what is, uh, what uh, does that well, he's mean? Got, he's, got, he's got two roles. He's the guy who sits there and watches the food go out to the table and sometimes takes it himself. He and sometimes takes it himself, it's true, but he, he goes into the kitchen, and when he's in the kitchen, the whole place changes. When he goes into the kitchen, it's like a library. It's just completely Silence. completely quiet. Nobody and everybody is so so focused. It's actually fantastic when he goes into the kitchen. He's looking at every single thing as it goes around. You know, he's dipping his fingers and he's tasting it. He's doing yeah. that. And then it's it's brilliant when he's in the kitchen. You know he's there. Oh, you know he's there. Oh, you know he's there. I mean, I had you know I had the one experience of I'd been working on the grill and I thought I finally got good and I got a little kind of a swagger and he'd been away. I think he was in Australia or Europe or wherever he was to promote something and he came back and I could tell he uh, he picked up my cockiness. You know, he picked up my swagger and he thought, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he started looking at food and looking at food and he decided that a pork was a little underdone. That could be fixed. But the lamb loin, that was a bit overdone. And that couldn't Can't be fixed. Be yeah. And that went out anyways. And then there was a little murmur and a little murmur. And then I was fired from the line that night. And I had to stand back and let everybody else do the work. And someone else came in and bumped me off to the side. And I was the guy who put salt and pepper. Now, how does he tell you you're fired from the line? He does it in a way different from most chefs. It's just as devastating, I think, as any other chef. I mean, in a French So this kitchen, happens in the kitchen a fair amount. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Afterwards, we, they all, after he left, they all crowd around me and they said, welcome to Babo. Yeah, welcome right, to the right, real right, kitchen right, life. Right. Now, you know, this is, this is what we all So what did he say to you? Well, in a French kitchen, the, tradition, the uh, practice is called plating. And the, the chef takes the plate, throws it on the floor. The, the plate breaks, and you're meant to clean it up and do the dish over again and get it out really quickly. It's just a huge public humiliation. But what Mario does, it's a kind of whispering thing. Yeah, there's a sous chef over here. This unacceptable. I just cannot do this. Unacceptable. And then the sous chef talks to someone else, and someone else talks to someone else, and someone comes up and says, I've taken your job tonight. And, and what do you do? Just leave? Uh, or, or, had you, I left. You go up to the corner and put on a dunce's hat. Had I left, had I left, it would have been over. Over. Had I left, I would have shown that uh, I couldn't take you it. You couldn't take it. Uh, had I left, I would have shown that I was like uh, different from everyone else. So what else. did you do? I, you know, the kitchen is really small. There wasn't, re and I just made myself as small as I, I was right up there against the grill and right up there against an oven. I had my back against one thing and my arm over the fire, and I, I just made myself as small as possible and tried to make myself useful. I put a little bit of salt on that and a little bit of pepper on that, and just, you know, until finally Mario went and someone snuck out into the dining room to make sure that he left. He said he's gone. And he told Come me back. to get back. Okay. And he told me to get back so I get my touch back because I was on the grill at that point, and and the whole point of cooking meat is 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 touch, and we it, once you get the touch you. You know, there's all that. If you look in cookbooks, it, you're, I'm always looking for when is a steak done? You know, when is a roast done? When is your chicken done? And they never tell you, or they tell you, and you think, well, that doesn't really sound right. But actually, in a restaurant, what they ex recognize is that meat varies, and cooking conditions vary, and it's all it's all by touch. And when you get the touch, you can tell exactly where the meat is, whether it's rare, medium rare, medium well done, and it's you know, that's the whole business of just cooking loads of food you get that kind of touch knowledge and he once said wretched excess wretched excess is just barely enough you know i don't think we're going to meet many people in our lives like mario i mean he's just i don't know sometimes i look at him and i just think you know this is this man is a metaphor of appetite we will just you know they're just exceptional human beings in our life you meet them all the time but he's mm -hmm. you know he's one of the ones who just he's you know the most astonishing thing on that first night, and it was just the beginning of astonishing things that I was going to learn, was his the thing he mentioned casually that he and his partner Joe Bastianich on a night out in Italy would regularly drink a case of wine for dinner. Now, I like my drink. A case. For a dinner. case of wine for dinner. Twelve bottles between two men, and I. I mean, I do like my drink, and I do like wine. Uh, I can't remember when I when I've had more than two between two people and then I'm really tipsy. a case of wine is a lot of wine and he does this often that was the um, that was the that was the proposal yes that was that was the idea and in uh, fact you know in time I never got up to a full case with Mario but in time over the course of the evening I know we reached about 10 bottles before I lost consciousness <laughs>
Now, tell me about his start. I mean, how did he become, because this book is really about him as well as you, how did he become Mario Batali? It was interesting. I think there are two crucial events. One was uh, recognizing that he wanted to cook. He went to the Cordon Bleu in London, got incredibly bored, found himself in a pub kitchen, and worked alongside a guy named Marco Pierre right, White. Right. Now, Marco Pierre White is a sort of legendary figure in British cooking, and uh, you know, a histrionic, hysterical, violent, aggressive maniac. And um, Mario walked out eventually. The, you know, the guy was beating up the dishwasher, he was smacking somebody else up. And um, but what Mario learned is that the whole cooking game was so much bigger than he thought. I mean, at that point, he was making strombolis in New Jersey, and you know, it's just like it's a big, big, wide open game. And the other thing was then having sort of launched on this career of education that followed his time with Marco, he then realized he had to get to something much more basic, and he quit his job. At the time, he was an executive chef in Santa Barbara, and he went to Italy, worked for no pay, and went there to learn Italian cooking from the women who do all the cooking in these Italian hill yeah. towns. And he went there to learn this Italian, he went there to learn handmade food. Handmade food of the kind that you do not get in urban American restaurants. Yeah. Handmade food of the kind that has been made in Italy for centuries and centuries and centuries. Handmade food of the sort you still can get in Italy. And he was there for three years and came back, uh, started a restaurant in Manhattan, it failed, started another restaurant, it became Poe, started another yeah, restaurant, po it was Bobo. Downtown of the village and then uh, and, and then Bobo you know, is, is the then, most famous restaurant. And Bobo is his most famous restaurant. And then this kind of consciousness has in, been informing all his other, other restaurants since. And at some point, uh, I felt I wanted to kind of reenact this journey. It's, it's a thing okay. that you, you, you get in the kitchen, is that everybody there recognizes that you can only learn so much in an Italian kitchen in New York before you finally have to go somewhere. Right. Go I, I want to take you to Italy in just a moment. But, but the idea is you're sitting in his kitchen at Babo doing these culinary things. And you decide that this is not a magazine piece for the New Yorker, in which you, by the way, have one in this this, this issue, I think, June 26. You want to do a book? It's true. I went into the kitchen. I was there about six months. I wrote a piece. It was in the New Yorker's first food issue. Yep. Uh, I was happy with it, except for the fact that... Now, this is the literary editor of the... or fiction editor of the New Yorker. I was then the fiction editor of the New Yorker. Uh, yeah, there was a sort of tricky moment. I think I was closing a story by Doctorow while I was using the reservations phone at Babo when Mario <laughs> Batali came in and he said, Look at that, the dude's using the reservation phones. And like, Mario, it's Doctorow. And he calls everybody dude? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's one of them, you know. Uh, I, you know he, the Doctorow line just didn't wash at that time. But, you know, I was closing a Doctorow yeah. story. And, um, now, did you know where this journey was going to end? Did no you idea. Think, did no you for idea. a moment think that I may be leaving literature for food? No idea. I Never. did not. I did you not. Didn't. I did not. Not not a moment in the journey no. between New York, Italy, back. This book, when I finally you know, decided I was going to write a book, was due three years ago and was meant to be one third of its current length. Um, you know, the whole thing kept changing from the very beginning. You know, I did a little piece for the New Yorker; it became a gigantic piece. But even the gigantic piece didn't capture the six months that I'd been been through. And even in those six months, I hadn't learned everything I wanted to learn. So when it was done. I wanted to go back to keep learning what I was learning. And I had this idea, I was mistaken, but I had this idea that I, I was really on the verge of, you know, mastering this thing. And I, I wasn't. I had to go another nine months or something like that before I even got into a position where I could hold my own on the line. Um, but even then, my idea was, okay, I'll go back. I'll take a little book leave. I'll go back in the kitchen for six months. I'll write a tiny little book, The Adventures of, um, you know, Being a Line Cook. But and no passion to open a restaurant, no passion to do anything in the food business. No, it was a passion just to know how to cook. And how do you use that today? Uh, I think I know how to cook. Okay, so you know how to cook. Do you have dinner parties all the time? Do, I mean, is it something that brings you unique pleasure because you have learned how to do it? It brings me unique pleasure, and without sounding too sentimental, it, 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 it makes me feel more connected to the earth. And what do you mean? Well, I think I understand the seasons now, and I cook with the seasons, and I understand animals, and uh, I, I, I know what meat is, and I, I think I know what my food is, and I know what good food is and what bad food is, and I think I have a much simpler understanding of how, how to nourish myself and how to use the earth at its best. For those of us who eat out all the time, is there anything that goes on in the kitchen that we do not want to know? Yes. What is it? 
Too much. But too much instance, that we don't <laughs> want to know. <laughs> well, you know, having said, I don't know, you know, Bobo is a very good kitchen. And, the, the, and to be fair to it, and it's not just because I, you know, I was there and, and you know, Mario has endorsed this, this, this journey of mine, but it actually is a good kitchen. So it's, you know, if something drops yeah. on the floor, it goes into the rubbish, and you got to start the whole thing over. But not there, everywhere, huh? Well, you hear stories. You hear stories. Um, there is, though, you know, a kitchen. A kitchen is unlike any work environment you have ever seen in your life. It is so. I was here in a Manhattan Manhattan restaurant where you've got sort of this 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 city of sophistication and political correctness and politeness and courtesy or rudeness within certain civilized yeah, right, norms. Right, right. And you, you go into a place that's aggressive, coarse, racist, sexist, brutal, and uh, I kind of loved it. I mean, I do know. I mean, the one thing I would recommend is, you know, if you're like the last guy in the restaurant, first, think carefully if you really need to eat a meal. <laughs> and second, if you do decide that you want to eat a meal, order, um, order something very quick and very light and preferably something that doesn't have to be cooked. Okay, but tell me why you say that. Yeah, you know, a restaurant, it's just common sense. Once you realize how, how a kitchen works. I mean, a kitchen is, especially in New York or even sort of any American urban kitchen that is busy, they go, they, go, they, they go through several hits over the course of the evening. There'll be several moments in the course of the evening when it is out of control. It is, and you're, everybody is just barely, barely, <laughs> barely hanging on. Some yeah. things go out, they're not quite right. No yeah. chance to look back again, it's gone. And you know, an, an, a typical restaurant evening goes something like this. And when it's, when you, when it's really out of control, it's, 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 it's like an athletic event. And then you do that one, you do that one, you do that one, and it's about 11 o'clock, and, you know, the executive chef has disappeared, and somebody's doing the ordering for tomorrow, and the bartender's come in with some beer, and 11 o'clock, everybody can start drinking, and, you know, someone's cleaning up the floor, <laughs> and then you arrive, you They're arrive not at 11.30, yeah. you give the maitre d' like 20, <laughs> with that extra table, and then you order the tasting menu, and everybody's, you know, hunkered around the, the ticket machine waiting for the order to come in, and they'll actually do this thing and say, well, I know if I was here, I'd order a salad, and I know when I'm last one, I always order, you know, like a one dish, like a pasta, and they're all waiting, and then it comes up, and it's like five tasting menus and you go, oh my god that, that it, yeah. you know you think, so, that, you think that meal's cooked with love no so now you're going you decide that you need to learn more you can't be a true chef or you can't understand the true experience of a good chef unless you go to italy well, uh, you know, I, I was cooking in a specific, I was learning how to cook in a specific tradition, the Italian, Italian food, tradition. Right. I mean, if it was a French restaurant, it, would, to be, it would be France. Well, it was, you're it planning, was a, in fact, you're planning to go to France now. That's your next journey, is it not? That will be the next journey. To learn French cooking? To learn French cooking. Okay, back to, to Italy. You're, you're, in fact, in an Italian restaurant, and you go to Italy, and you go, tell me about the experience of what you met and how they viewed food, A, and you, B. Well, I should say first, I intended to go for two weeks. <laughs> I did, and, and you because stayed? I was, you know, at that point, I was still, you know, a writer, right? Um, and I was trying to capture the experience of a kitchen and what a, you know, kind of trying to yeah, simulate right, yeah. the journey of making myself yeah. into a cook in a way that was a parallel to Mario's journey of making himself into right. a cook, which is parallel to everybody else in that kitchen making themselves into a cook. And the idea is that you can only learn so much in a kitchen in New York that's pretend that's ostensibly Italian without going to Italy and learning the real thing. So I thought I'd go for two weeks. Um, and I went there, and, uh, well, I made a couple journeys, actually. One journey was to the town where Mario learned how to make pasta. Yeah. And I was also taught by the woman who taught Mario how to make pasta. And what did you learn about making pasta? It was probably my first lessons in handmade food. Um, it was uh, first lessons in the primacy of ingredients. You know, like the pasta... That's the point I was just making, and you... Certain people. Dumped on it. No, no, no. There's just two schools, but one, one school certainly is working with your primary ingredients, and in pasta, it's all in the egg. It's just all in the egg, and if you get good eggs that are made from really half wild, genuine, free range chickens out in your back garden kind yeah. of eggs, then you're going to make amazing pasta. And if you make pasta from uh, industrial, uh, you know, chicken farms with with watery yolks. The pasta is going to suck, and it just it's evident from the moment. In Italy, they have a the yolk is called the rosso, yeah. the red, the red part, and it is true that when you get a really good good egg, the yolk is almost red, and that's what contributes to that kind of yellow pasta that you associate with Italy. It's made with good eggs, and it was evident very, on my first day there because the uh, Johnny Valdiseri, Betta's husband, had fallen asleep. There was quite a lot of red wine at lunch to celebrate my arrival. 
And uh, the place where they get their good eggs had closed. We had to go to the sort of the Cactiva Alimentario to buy the really evil eggs, and the pasta was awful. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, there's because a whole way... Because the eggs were awful. Because the eggs were awful. Right. And actually, it was my first lesson in what I came to recognize as kind of small food and big food. And big food is the kind of industrial, supermarket, mass market, mass distributed food that we've all grown up with. Uh, because we live in a country that is driven by mass distribution. And it's all made in gigantic quantities. But when you get the smaller quantities and you get the real thing, it makes all the difference in the world. You end up working for a butcher. Dario Cicchini. Dario Cicchini. The mad, uh, the mad Dante quoting butcher in Penzano. Quoted Dante. Uh, recited Dante. I mean, when the first time we went there, uh, you know, I'd phoned him and... Uh, he said, you know, I cited, you know, I, had, I was just learning Italian. I'd been to the school Italiana in del Greenwich Village. <laughs> and, um, you know, I had my little, my little yeah. exchange, you know, sono giornalista. Um, and I cited Mario, and I cited Mario's dad, and he said, come. And I got there, and he spotted me in this crowded butcher shop. Now he's with, how old? He's, uh, 50, he's 50. Okay. He's 50. So he spots you. And uh, immediately started uh, Dante's Inferno, uh, you know, and uh, started off in the first canto and the second canto. And he, he's in this tiny little butcher shop with a hundred people there, and they're giving everyone lardo and free wine and free food, and it's 10.30 in the morning or something like that, and everybody's raucous and drunk, and he's doing this resuscitation of Dante. In the background is Mozart's uh, Requiem at full blast, and I don't know, the whole thing was just, it was opera. And uh, I, I walked into this opera, and that was where I was going to work. Now, can you find that experience in America? Well, you know, we're, you know they, they, these are operatic personalities. And, the, and mm. the truth is, Mario is an operatic personality. Marco Pierre White okay. is an operatic it's personality. It's just that they're different because of the shape. Uh, and Dario is an operatic. I mean, what, what Dario is doing is unlike anything that is being done here and is unlike anything being done probably anywhere in America. And that's probably what Italians, the good, the good people in Italy are doing, which is they recognize the virtues and the integrity of handmade food. They recognize the virtues and integrity of what I come to call small food. Uh, food from a, you know, you, you want to know the person, you want to know your producer by name. Right. You want to know, you want to know the guy, Enrico, who makes yeah. your olive oil. You want to know where you're getting your hens. You, know, you want to know where you're getting your meat. You want to know everybody on a first name basis. If you know everybody on a first name basis, chances are it's pretty good. You became a pretty good butcher. I became a butcher. This is when. Well, did you become a better butcher than Mario is? Uh, Mario's not a butcher. I know that, but yeah. it, but you learned more than he did about butchering. Uh, is that the right word, butchering? Yeah, butchering. I certainly learned more about Tuscan butchery than than Mario knows, but that's by. But can he accept that? Well, we had a great you know sort of debriefing meeting, and I I started rabbiting on about all the cuts that I learned because in Tuscany butchering is this great art and. It's different from here, and it's probably different from anywhere else in Italy. I mean, they have this kind of reverence <laughs> of the cow. It's their soul food. Yeah. And they, they take a leg, and we have a leg, and it's like you get the shank, and you got your rump roast, and, you know, that's it. And there, it's, it's, like, it's, it's like a road map. It's like 150 different cuts, and they all have different qualities, and they all have different names. And you yeah. prepare this one with fava beans. You, you prepare this one with peas, and you do this one with olive oil, and this one you do roast very slowly, and this one you do raw. And, uh, yeah, I'd come back and I was mentioning the Giorello to Mario and the, you know, what are, all these other different terms. And he just looked at me and said, dude, I don't know what you're talking about. Because he didn't know much. No, I didn't, well, he didn't yeah. know that. And that's when I realized, man, I've learned something. Yeah. If Mario was sitting here and I said to him, tell me what Buford has learned, what would he say? Uh, learned that how I, to be a good chef? He, he, I think he would say, first of all, I've learned the difference between the professional kitchen and the amateur cook. Which is, and one more time? Uh, knowing how to prepare something exactly the same under pressure over and Ooh. over and over again. You know, uh, the interesting thing, that's true about golf, that's true about tennis, that's true about a whole lot of things. I, I assume it's true about surgery. It, it's not, actually a lot of it is not that different from surgery. You know, going in there and doing it well the same way every time. That's the difference between the professional and the... Exactly. But I think he, he I th well actually I saw him last night and he, uh, someone put the question to him and he said... Um, yeah, I'm a cook. I'm just a slow cook. <laughs> You're a slow cook, yes. By his standards. I mean, by my yeah. friend's standards, I'm probably... But does he cook much anymore at all? Well, Come on. you know, he's, he's not going to be on the line, but well, he's... but, but he's... does he, I mean, does he have people to his house and does he cook? Have well, you seen him cook a meal in the last two years? Uh, now, whenever Mario comes over for dinner, he, he cooks. cooks. Oh, really? In fact... Because he insists or you, you want him to? 
No, no, he, he you know, Mario, you invite Mar Mario Batali to dinner and he said, sure, I'll cook. You don't say no. no of course not. No, Mario, you know, we want to say, yeah, come on. Oh, yeah, exactly. You know. Yeah, he Good. cooks. In fact, we had a little wager uh, that, you know, he was finishing a cookbook and I was finishing this book and uh, the... Uh, the loser had to had to buy some uh, French bottles of wine of a of a of a rather famous kind, and I was the loser, and and he he would organize the meal to drink these wines. But so you had to go out and well, in fact, we had to postpone wallet. it because my wife, meanwhile, got pregnant with twins, and our life has got a little more complicated. But he he will he will no doubt cook when we drink these bottles of wine. Yes, he does cook. Yeah, but his genius really in the in the kitchen is he con he's conceives dishes, and one of the great things sitting with him and his cooks whenever the season changes is they just start. They just start fabulating, you know, these great fabulations of dishes. Now, what else should we say about the Italian experience there? Because, I mean, the characters are larger, they're more, they're fascinating. You know, whether it's reading, whether it's quoting Dante or listening to Mozart, or their love of what they do and their extraordinary sense of uh, being able to go to the source. You know, who, in every case, they can get the best from. Well, what else did you come away, how long were you there? Uh, six months in the first stint, and then came back the following summer for two, three more months. That's and nine months there. Yeah, um, in yeah. fact, you know, I'll be going back again this summer and butchering again. I mean, it's Why now... are you doing that this summer? Because uh, I now feel I'm connecting to something. And uh... Okay, speak to that. This is some kind of, what kind of experience? Spiritual, not spiritual, but... I think it's kind of at the heart of the charisma of food. It's, it's why you get these kind of passionate loons in the first place. You know, food is always on the verge of meaning so much more than just food. And you, and you see it in Italy more than in, in any of us. Betta, the one woman who taught me pos, uh, how to make pasta, used a phrase for making tagliatelle, which is, you know, you roll it out and you let it air and you yeah, let it dry a little yeah, bit, yeah. but not too dry. Yeah, yeah. And then when I was learning Italian, and I then learned Renaissance Italian, and I learned all these great cooks in the Renaissance, I came across the exact same phrasing for making tagliatelle in the 16th century. And I thought only in Italy would you find someone repeating the instructions word for word five centuries later or something like that. In Italy, you, 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 always, you always have the ghost of somebody nearby, but it's quite a friendly ghost often. It's quite yeah, a, it's, 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 you know, you have those kitchen, it's sort of food and mortality, sort of nourishment and death. Yeah. They're always, always next to each other. Talk about the idea of a restaurant as business. Mario says what a restaurateur does, he takes stuff, he adds value, he sells it as a profit. The person that can influence the success of your restaurant is a critic. And in New York, we're in an unusual position of having a publication that's got unbelievable clout. New York Times. The New York Times. You know, and the Michelin Guide has launched its, its New York Michelin Guide, and the people who got three stars are very happy, and right. they're all connected to the great French tradition and all that. Right, right. But still, the New York Times has got this, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's like what the sort of the theater critic used to be and when, when, when there was a sort of a really sort of vital th theater business. The restaurant critic now has got unbelievable clout. And any restaurant knows that. I mean, they live for the review, and right. the, review, the review will either start to make the business or put it on, on, on standby or kill it. Because there are, and I'm one of them occasionally, people who read a great review about a great restaurant, they either go that night, the next night, or the next night, your first call. If you see the New York Times say something great yeah. about a restaurant, you yeah. can't wait. To get there. And if they trash it, it's gone. If you just, yeah, just yeah, erase one, you know, you're looking at oh, one star or no oh, stars, oh, it's yeah. gone. It's just right. like just, just erased. So what happened when Frank Bernie, I think, is the New York Times food critic, restaurant critic? Well, ever since I was at working in the Bible Kitchen, they were always waiting for the day when the restaurant critic was going to come and review them again. They got three stars from Ruth Reichel right. when she was the restaurant critic. And every day, that was sort of the terror of the kitchen. Frankie was then the sous chef. He's now the executive chef. He's going, we got to defend our three stars. And Mario's got me here to defend our three stars. And everything's going to be perfect to defend our three stars. They're all set for when that critic and came. And do they know when the critic... Because Ruth makes a point that she used to disguise herself when she went to a restaurant. They completely they know. know. And, Mar and Mario insists not only do they know, but they can change the whole kitchen t to suit the critic. And when, <laughs> when Ruth Reichel came around, she wasn't to know this, but the whole, this, Bobo is, is a two-floor restaurant. Right, right. The second floor was closed. Right. Uh, there was a limited number of people at the bar. There was a very specific music that was being played, her music. They knew she liked Bob Marley, so they yeah. made a point in playing Bob Marley. Oh, they, only, they, only, they only had so many people in the restaurant. Yeah. Mario was then the cook. Yeah. Uh, the Mario cook. came out to the table or not? Mm, don't know if he came out to the table. He probably came out to the table, but he was certainly running the kitchen. Uh, everybody was going to be in sort of other positions later, yeah, but they yeah. weren't allowed until Ruth had finished her review. And they knew when she was coming, and they knew when, what fake name it was booked under, and it was completely controlled. The trouble with Frank Bruni is that 
uh, when Bruni came to Babo, nobody knew what he looked like. He was the new critic. He was the new guy on the block. Yeah. And I think what, he'd been the uh, correspondent in Italy. Before. Well, that was the, that was the worst thing. He said he actually knew Italian <laughs> food. He was the Roman, cor you know, exactly. he was the, he was the Roman correspondent. Yeah. So he he'd been there two years. Uh, nobody knew what he looked like. The yeah. last thing in the world they would expect is like the new restaurant critic would go to Babo. And I was meant to have dinner with Mario. Uh, when suddenly in a panic, he phoned and said, "Oh my God, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't go out. The, 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 new, the new restaurant critic is here." <laughs> but what he hadn't realized is it was like Bruni's fifth visit or something like that. He completely yeah. made up his mind. Had not seen me, and he did not know it. They didn't He'd know it. He'd been there four they times, had, and they didn't know they it. Had Man, no, they had no idea. That'll drive you crazy if you. And this is at a very, you know, this is at a very precarious point in the restaurant, and you know. One food critic was trashing some of the dishes, and they had a new chef in there, and Mario was having to be there to help train the kitchen, and lots of people left. It was probably the worst possible time a restaurant could have, could have been there. Back to Italy. What did those people think of Mario? Well, you may you tell know, you, you may tell you what you say. Um, <laughs> you, know, the, the, you know, I think the view in Italy is that uh, Italians know how to cook Italian food, yeah. and they're not going to take any instruction from a New York, a New York so-called Italian cook. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know, that was that was probably basically the view. The most interesting one, and in a way, the saddest was uh, Betta, the woman who taught Mario how to make right, pasta, right. and you know, they thought. They thought we've taught Mario everything he knows, and now he's rich and famous, and we're still poor. And how does yeah. that work? Yeah. Um, and when he arrived, you know, Mario knew all these fancy things. But in this part of Italy, there's only one way of cooking, which is the way your grandmother cooked, and the way her grandmother cooked, and the way her grandmother cooked. And Mario couldn't do that kind of cooking, so therefore he wasn't a good cook. Yeah, right. And they taught him everything that they knew, and then he went off. And Mario's sort of his story of of, uh, of arrival is how his Italian family and in the mountains taught him everything that he knows and in many ways they did but uh and they believed it and now he's a big success and they're not but of course it made me think of like uh you know Eric Clapton or something like that or you know one of the sort of great rock star rock rock guitarists right. going down to the 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 juke New joints Orleans. the juke joints in Mississippi right. and, and learning, learning their the blues, blues licks right. and and you know there is a lot to learn because if you've been down there you know those yeah. guys do amazing things and, and then they, they take them back and then they become great yeah. they say well I learned it all in Mississippi and then the guys back in Mississippi still living in a shack and some guys making all this money yeah or, it was or, a very very similar thing and you know it's 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 just a it's just inherent in the in the nature of the thing how do the italians feel about the french ooh they loathe the french <laughs> they loathe the you know mario has a whole thing about how he hates the french and you know the french was all repressed and they sort of they cut their food like this and all that but it's nothing like the italians yeah. and i was at the butcher shop and the only thing i had to do to provoke the butcher was say ooh dario shallots aren't shallots uh french and he just explode. He just just explode. And, no, 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 no. We we gave the French shallots. We taught the French how to cook. We taught the French how to use artichokes. And we taught the French how to do this and do that. And you know, there's actually something to it. Because when you're in Tuscany, you see these dishes and you think, oh, aren't those French? And you discover that actually Started. they've been they've yeah. been in Italy for centuries, like a custard, you know, a creme anglaise. And you, and you think, well, actually, it it did it is or a flans or or crepes, which in in Tuscany are called crepelle, a, a certain kind of pasta. But you are prepared, you are now planning to go to France and live for a year or so? Well, we don't know. That's the next... Next what? Next mad adventure. Um, next mad book? Uh, no doubt, next mad book. And it's informed well, by how this... How will it be different than this? Is it simply Buford goes to Paris to duplicate what he did in Italy and, and with Mario Batali? I've got no idea. Uh, but the, you'll the, just the, go the main, and find the, it? The main thing that's motivating me now is that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a lot of pleasure from learning. And as long as I can be stupid and curious, yeah. then I think I'm going to make it work. Okay, but can you look back? I mean, because lots of people would like to be informed by this. You know, what was it? Emerson said, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation, I think he said. Meaning that they reach a middle life crisis and they're not doing what they like. And so they fantasize about all the things that they might do that would bring them more satisfaction, more joy, more thrill to their life. Uh, is any of that what happened to you that you wanted to change, you wanted to go feel something different? Not consciously. But I mean, I, did, I wasn't at a point where I said, um, I don't like my life. 
I, my life had a lot you of had a great life. No I had life. a great life. Right? I, had, I, had, like, I had sort of like the best civilian yeah. job one can right. have. I was the fiction editor exactly of the New Yorker. Right. So you'd sit around and read books and edit them. Uh, and Don't you know, a magazine coming yeah, out every right. week, which right. was you know cutting edge and stimulating, and right, right there right, at the, sort right, of right. the vanguard of the vanguard. Yeah, you've been doing that for a long time, though. But a long time. But you know, one of my things was I was a I was a good editor, uh, and that was what I did. Yeah. And I think I stopped learning. Um, when I ran Granta Magazine, what I liked about Granta Magazine was that it was constant adversity. And I love that adversity. I love, I love the energy that came from, from having a, always having to climb that mountain. And I think I just got, I, I, you know, not that I was, I'm not going to say that I was that good, but I got good enough that I didn't have that kind of adversity anymore. And I stopped learning. What I liked about this and what kept me going and why when I went to Italy for two weeks then I had to go back for another month and came back and I'd go back for another month and come back is that I was learning all the time and I loved it. Uh, I was in the Babo kitchen and I'd look around me and there was like, oh, that's how you do that. Oh, is that what you can do with yeah. fennel? And, oh, is that yeah. what you mean? That's how you braised it. I loved it. I, every lesson in food, which interested me, and culture, which interested me, and how, and how a kind of culture expresses itself in its food, which interested me, was there on display and I was, I was devouring it. So where are you on the learning curve? I'm still stupid and curious. <laughs> I mean, as long as I'm stupid and curious, it works. And the moment I stop, then yeah. I guess I'll be into some. I mean, you know, what does Mario it, tell you? You're just starting. Uh, you know, we playfully talked about the possibility of, of uh, my starting a restaurant, and did you give it serious consideration? Uh, you know, a couple. I was tempted by the. He, you know, he was proposing that Jessica and I, my wife, yeah. should start a restaurant in Italy. Jessica's a beautiful Italian speaker, yeah. and. It could happen, and then he talked about the idea of doing one here, and then I thought I could do Dario's butcher shop here, and I could learn, you know, how to do my inferno, and I could stand up on the podium and start reciting it. And yeah. I learned all his preparations. So why didn't you do that? Uh, I don't want to run a restaurant. Um, I, I really got into this because I wanted. Everybody to... who everybody who runs a restaurant will say to you, "It's a twenty-four hour seven." Well, 20, I know. I'm a, I was seven. there. I was, yeah. you know, I was there, and the, I, I know what it is. Physically. Especially if you're starting a new one. Yeah, I, I know what these. I know what these people go through. I mean, I'm, you know, I've got no illusions. It's not just the physical labor. It's just that actually, I'm probably a writer. This is, this is called building a better dessert. Buford on the Prince, of pastry. Tell me about desserts, because that's what are you. Do you know about desserts? No, now? I know nothing. Exactly. And that's, this is me being stupid and curious again. I thought, all right, I'm going to go into desserts, and this is just now, the how same. Do, how do most chefs view desserts within the, the panorama of food they prepare? Wow, that's 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 kind of a big deal. It's I mean, in a way, the there's the main kitchen and there's the pastry kitchen, right? And they're two different kitchens. Uh, at Babo, the pastry kitchen had its own chef. And she ran it with her own cooks, and they did their own preparations, and they were over there in one part. And in the evening, they were the last ones to leave because they were the last dishes that everybody had yeah. to eat. But in other kitchens, like in the Spanish kitchens and El Bulli and things like that, because desserts are the most technical things, a lot of people regard them as sort of the engine of innovation in cooking. I mean, it's, they're like, it's a whole other school. And that's why I got interested in it. I realized, okay, I can do meat. You know, I can, I can do, do pasta. I can do pasta. I can I can go to the green market now, and I, you know, I can do the chef's thing where I don't know what I'm going to cook tonight, but I'll go to the green market and I go, oh, it's peas today. Oh, I'm going to do something. Oh, there's some mint, and oh, maybe I'll get some pork. Now, where is your wife as a chef? Uh, she's a very very good cook, but uh, because we live in a New York apartment with a small kitchen, I think she feels a little crowded out by the big fat man who's taking up the middle <laughs> space. It's a bit like a squash. So game. you cook more meals than she does, for the family and for small. Group of friends. Mm -hmm.